I'm going to now introduce uh, Dr. Asher Thgruha. He is one of our colleagues, and at first he's going to talk about uh, LVADs and mechanical support more in detail, uh, filling for Dr. Brian Bruckner, who's actually in the OR. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Park. Uh, well, welcome, everyone. So, in the interest of time, we'll uh, uh, try to go and uh, finish all of this in about 10 minutes. You know, each of these is almost a day-long symposium, so I'll try. Uh, so, uh, again, I'm filling in for Dr. Brockner, who's in surgery. So, really, the objectives are to give you an update on, you know, what are the indications for a permanent LVAD, and uh, talk about the device strategies in terms of bridge to transplant and destination therapy, look at some of the clinical benefits and contraindications. So really, the, you know, the, the first thing, again, this is our advanced heart failure team. We'll skip this slide and uh, go straight away to indications for advanced interventions. Um, so when you're looking at patients who need either an LVAD or transplant, you're looking at patients who are in stage D heart failure. It's defined as patients who have refractory heart failure symptoms uh, refractory to uh, any medical therapy and persistently have NYHA class uh, four um, symptoms. And the other things which objectively that you can do to ensure that they are in end stage are uh, things like right heart catheterization which show an elevated wedge pressure and decreased cardiac index. Um, you know, in the absence of inotropes, and also a cardiopulmonary exercise test, which can show you a peak oxygen consumption. And if it's less than 12 or definitely, definitively under 10, suggests that these patients are in end-stage heart failure with really poor prognosis in the next six to 12 months. And these are the patients in whom you should consider uh, any of these advanced uh, cardiac therapies, which is transplant or LVAD. So, you know, the big thing with transplant is that the donor heart supply is limited. Now, in the last couple of years, though the donor supply has increased a little bit, but still it's in the realm of, you know, 2,500 or 3,000 donors a year. So, whereas there are about 16,000 patients on the wait list. So, you know, it's only about one-eighth um, the number of uh, patients that are waiting that you have hearts available. And, uh, you know, even with heart transplantation, one-year survival is about 89 percent, five-year survival is about 75 percent, and 10-year survival is about 55 percent. So what can you offer these other patients who are on the wait list and potentially, you know, either not, uh, you know, either too sick to get transplanted or can't wait for a heart transplant? And um, we now here, this is a list of patients who um, can't get a heart transplant for various contraindications such as elevated pulmonary vascular resistance, advanced end organ disease, um, or you know cross match incompatibility due to which they can't wait for too long, or relative contraindications such as age, malignancy, and uh, size and obesity. So you know that's where uh, the mechanical circulatory support or durable mechanical circulatory support came into being. Now, the first trial for this uh, was in 2001, where um, a, a pulsatile pump, which was, you know, HeartMate XVE, was compared to inotropic therapy and was found to be superior. And since then, as you can see here, the number of patients living with LVADs continues to rise. Uh, and um, in 2008, um, uh, a continuous flow LVAD was compared to the historical uh, pump, which was pulse-style pump, and was found to be superior to that. So from 2008 onwards, you can see that uh, the number of uh, uh, you know, continuous flow LVADs are in increasing every year. So again, this is from the Intermax uh, database. This is a database of all patients with LVADs. And as you can see here, compared to the previous generation LVADs, the one-year survival here, you know, with continuous flow LVADs is up to about 81 percent. And, uh, you know, th this was a study which was looking at seeing whether, you know, if you can give these patients LVAD, can you put off transplant for, you know, um, for some time? And uh, overall, you know, the message from the study was that at least in status two patients, uh, this was really not inferior, which means status to our patients who are stable at home. 
So I think uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to just skip this. So um, in terms of you know what happens to patients who get an LVAD and then go on to get a transplant, again, these uh, uh, patients do as well as those who've been transplanted without an LVAD. So uh, the message again here is that if patients cannot wait for a transplant, uh, just with medical therapy, then you know it's uh, ideal to get them to an LVAD so that they can wait safely and then go uh, get a transplant. Um, and this is again from the Intermax database showing that you know that about 88 percent alive at one year when you uh, trans I mean, do um, LVAD as a bridge to transplant indication. Now, currently, as of one or two years ago, this whole bridge to transplant and destination therapy. Um, uh, has undergone a little bit of uh, revision where there are really only two indications per uh, uh, Medicare where either your bridge to transplant or DT. Earlier on, there used to be another category called, you know, bridge to decision, which we have gotten away with. Um, again, uh, this is now switching gears to destination therapy. Uh, destination therapy is when you are, you know, uh, implanted with an LVAD as your final uh, end organ intervention as far as the heart is concerned. And um, as uh, we get more comfortable with the pump and, and as more centers you know, implant these, more and more uh, centers are implanting uh, LVADs as destination therapy. And um, again, you know, when you look at uh, destination VAD therapy survival, it's improving every year and now we are, you know, close to about 78 to 80 percent survival. Now you have to realize that these lot of these patients are actually not transplant candidates. So a lot of them have contraindications to transplant. Hence, you know, these patients' survival uh, is expected to be lesser. But if you, you know, these are patients who otherwise would have lived probably six months to a year. So their uh, overall survival would have been about, you know, 50, 25 to 50 percent at one year. And now you're, you know, giving them uh, at least, uh, you know, 80 percent one-year survival and almost 65 percent three-year survival. Um, and you know, LVADs also give you a good quality of life. And as you can see here, you know, uh, the the quality of life continues to improve. And usually hits a plateau around uh, 12 months. But the the quality of life improvement that people get stays about the same. So that's important to know because, I mean, if they get uh, improvement for a few months and then, you know, starts to go back down, then that's not ideal. Um, again, you know, the, the big thing with any of these end organ interventions is that, you know, they do come with their set of problems. If it's transplant, you're dealing with rejection, infections, you know, and graft failure, whereas with LVADs, you are dealing with, you know, risk of bleeding and clotting. Uh, but all these adverse side effects have been decreasing over time as we get more familiar with the pump and we get better at managing these complications. So uh, in terms of the patient profiles, like Dr. Eastep mentioned, you know, the critical cardiogenic shock patients uh, are not the ideal patients to do any durable end organ intervention, whether it's transplant or LVAD. And these uh, patients are decreasing with time as more temporary mechanical support options become available, uh, a lot of these patients are getting those uh, devices as they get better and then getting durable uh, assist devices. Again, the reason not to do it is you can see it on the graph here on the right where the Intermax 1 patients do not do very well after uh, a durable LVAD. Uh, again, what are the contraindications to implantation of a long-term LVAD? Severe hemodynamic instability, you know, irreversible major end organ failure, such as, you know, ESRD or uh, patients who are on home oxygen because of end-stage COPD, major coagulopathy because all the patients with an LVAD have to be on uh, antiplatelet and an anticoagulant, and significant right-sided heart failure because, you know, these are univentricular device for the most part, and the uh, patients with significant right-sided heart failure do not do very well, both in the short term and long term. And again, uncertain neurologic status, people who are on a ventilator and comatose, they should not be getting any durable device. And again, prolonged need for mechanical ventilation is not, you know, these are patients who should not be getting uh, an LVAD. 
They can sepsis or vasodilatory syndromes. These patients do not do well after going through a cardiopulmonary bypass. So these are some of the patients who should not be considered for a durable Elvan implant. Um, again, this is Medamax, which looks at 12-year event-free survival in patients who are on medical therapy. And you know, compared to 2001 till now, 12-month uh, event-free survival in end-stage heart failure patients has not really changed much. It's still about 50 percent. Uh, all, all people put together. Um, so again, you know, that's why we make a case that when patients en enter end-stage heart failure, they should be considered for a durable intervention. I think I'm going to stop here for this talk, and I think we'll, we'll go to the next talk, please.